I'll begin in a moment. The expectant hush is killing me. <laughs> My notes already say, hello everyone, I'm John Harris. I'm glad I've got them. And then it says, introduce yourself however you'd like, so I will. Uh, I write for The Guardian, uh, mostly about politics, or the sort of gap between politics and real life is the way that I usually explain it. It's very big at the moment, you may have noticed. Uh, I also sort of keep saying, particularly at this time of year after party conference season, by uh, writing about music. I still listen to music a lot. I used to be a music journalist for my sins. Uh, and my first acquaintance with uh, the man on my left, literally as well as metaphorically and <laughs> physically perhaps, Although not, I think we're on about the same part of the spectrum, and always have been. Uh, came in 1984, a significant year for all sorts of reasons, when I bought a cassette copy of his second album, and I made a habit of listening to it on my paper round, for which I was paid £3.60 a week, it occurred to me just now. The living wage didn't happen in those days. Um, and I used to uh, stuff copies of The Sun and The Daily Mail and The Daily Express through the letterboxes of people in the Cheshire suburb where I lived, while listening intently to a song called It Says Here. It's the first track on that, on that cassette, uh, which was about the corrupt power of the tabloid press. It's interesting, what goes around comes around. Here we are, 30 years later. And nearly 30 years later, 29 years later, that album has been followed by 10 more. I think at least 10 more Billy Bragg records. Um, I don't have a paper round anymore, I'm pleased to say. And I paid slightly more than £3.60 a week, but I still listen just as avidly, uh, to the latest record, the latest Billy Bragg record, which is called Tooth and Nail, as I did to that record all those years ago, and I can't really say that about many or any artists at all. Um, the man responsible for those records, as you all know, is a musician. He's also a writer, a campaigner, a philanthropist, a philanthropist, and one of the themes that he's concentrated on in recent years, most notably in a book called The Progressive Patriot, which is a memoir, I reviewed Morrissey's autobiography for the enemy last week, and I can safely say that The Progressive Patriot is a much better memoir than Morrissey's autobiography. <laughs> I will never reread Morrissey's autobiography, but I have reread The Progressive Patriot. And the sort of central thread of that book, to some extent, is about a tradition within English politics of resistance to arbitrary power, and the fact that from time to time in English history, at key points, there's a sort of quest to hold power to account, to bring it down a, a peg or two. Um, we've reached a point, I think, and I know Billy thinks, again, in the history of this country, where it seems that we've got to have another push in that direction, and that's what he's going to be talking about tonight, after which I'll have a chat to him for about 10 minutes, and then we'll open it up for discussion. Now I revert to my script with which I've been provided. Before we begin, could you please ensure your mobile phones are switched to silent? This event is being recorded. It's also being streamed, I think I'm right in saying, in both video and audio. Uh, and if you'd like to share the podcast and video with your friends and colleagues, if you have any, uh, they'll be available for free download from the RSA website in a few days' time. Uh, I need to say welcome to our online viewers out there. And a reminder that if you want to tweet about tonight's event in entirely complimentary ways, then hashtag RSA in block capitals Billy. Capital B, lowercase i double -L, l y is the hashtag to use. That's it. Please join me in welcoming Billy Bragg. Well, thank you very much, John, and thank you very much to the RSA for inviting me to come along and uh, speak for 20 minutes on a single issue. Anyone who's seen me perform live will know I often do that at gigs, between songs, between most songs. Uh, uh, hence the, the shows of Springsteen-esque length, uh, made up of merely half a dozen songs. But no songs tonight, just, uh, just some thoughts about uh, this issue, no power without accountability, which as uh, MPWA is the title of uh, a song of mine. So, um, you may have read last week of the intention of Pierre Omidyar, the billionaire founder of eBay, to start a news organisation. He's the second of the so-called tech titans 
to turn his attention to the news media after Amazon founder Jeff Bezos bought the Washington Post for £250 million a few months ago. Omidia spoke of his new investment as something that I would be personally involved in outside of my other efforts as a philanthropist. And I have to say that statement left me feeling a little queasy uh, as it hinted uh, at a fu future newspaper market in which unprofitable titles were maintained by super rich owners, much in the way that Rupert Murdoch uh, keeps going the notoriously unprofitable times. Now, what attracts billionaires like the Barclay brothers, Murdoch and others to the news media? What can owning a newspaper offer the man who has everything? I think the short answer to that is power. Owning a newspaper allows you to employ staff who will follow your agenda and promote your pet causes. For instance, a referendum on our membership of the European Union is going to be undoubtedly offered to the electorate at the next election, but it's not even at the, in the top ten of voter concerns. It's not even the most important thing to you, KIP supporters. Why do our, our politicians feel the need to, to put this in a manifesto? Those, those of you who follow the tweets of Rupert Murdoch will know the reason why. It's because it's one of his pet causes. The long-established credo of newspapers is that they should comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable becomes somewhat compromised when the proprietors of many newspapers are themselves exceedingly comfortable. And the last thing these powerful men want is someone coming along and telling them what they can and can't do. We've seen that in their response to the phone hacking inquiry. Lord Leveson's recommendations have been traduced by the papers themselves as an affront to freedom as if publishing the private diary of a mother whose daughter has been abducted is as crucial to our democracy as revealing the true extent of MPs' expenses. Now, while some newspaper editors have clearly mistaken liberty for licence, I'm sure we all feel that a free press is crucial to an open society. I certainly feel that. But as citizens, we have the right to, ha to ask who guards the guardians. And the suggestion that this question might be answered by legislation has set off alarm bells, not just in the news media here, but uh, more particularly in the United States of America, where their Bill of Rights clearly states the government shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. So, you know, as far as our American cousins are concerned, the Leveson recommendations sound like nothing short of tyranny. Now, I think that's because the Americans have a different concept of freedom to the one that's broadly held on this side of the Atlantic. Their concept of freedom, as expressed in the Constitution, is a relatively modern construct. The United States was established in the late 18th century by a radical Republican settlement whose authors sought to be free men in their own dominion, no longer subject to taxation by a distant and unresponsive empire. And that urge to be free from central control still animates American democracy, as we've seen in the, the Tea Party movement. The British Constitution is 100 years older, exactly. The American Constitution was ratified in 1789. Our Constitution, such as it is, dates back to 1689, to the Glorious Revolution. Uh, but that settlement is only one uh, the most recent of a series of settlements that have given freedom a different definition in the United Kingdom to that expressed in the United States Constitution. The rights of British citizens have their roots in the great dynastic struggles in the Middle Ages. Tired of King John's tyranny, the English barons forced him to sign the Magna Carta in 1215, which was the first attempt to limit the arbitrary power of kings. Another settlement came in the 16th century with the rejection of the absolute power of the Pope during the Reformation, an event that did so much to shape our nation. The third great settlement was wrought from the civil wars that pitted Crown against Parliament in the 1640s. Once again, the English railed against the tyrannical power of a monarch who believed that he was above the law. 
The struggle to hold absolute power to account was finally resolved in 1689 when Parliament staged a coup, ousting James II in favour of William of Orange. But before he took the throne, William was required to sign the British Bill of Rights, guaranteeing parliamentary power and privileges. And it's this document, an agreement between the Crown and Parliament, there are no constitutional documents in, in our uh, nation that begin, we the people, as, as uh, elsewhere. That, uh, that document gave birth to the constitutional monarchy that still underpins the British state. What is significant about these great settlements is that they all occurred before the modern notion of freedom had been broadly established. Before Thomas Paine asserted that freedom was vested in individual liberty, the British found their freedom through the struggle to hold those in power to account. And to this day, in the United States of America, the concept of freedom is most loudly expressed by those who wish to be free from society, free from taxation, from regulation, and from censure. On this side of the Atlantic, freedom is more often articulated by those who wish to be free to participate in society, freedom from poverty, from ignorance, from illness, and from discrimination. In the US, those calling for universal health care are accused of being un-American, European, socialist. Whereas those in the UK who argue for, argue for even greater deregulation and more exploitation are thought by many as being somehow alien to our way of doing things. And this, this latter sensibility has its roots in the last great settlement achieved by the British people, the founding of the welfare state in 1948. The universal health care that we take for granted was the culmination of a hundred years of hard work and struggle by ordinary working people who sought to hold capitalism to account. After the failure of the Chartist movement to gain the vote for working men, the focus shifted into the workplace and campaigns for better pay and shorter hours were eventually fruitful and in 1900 the unions formed their own political party to represent the cause of labour and this party finally came to power in 1945. In the years that followed, policies aimed at creating a fairer society saw the percentage of wealth received by the richest 1% fall year on year from 13% to 6% in the mid 70s. This trend was reversed in 1979 with the election of Margaret Thatcher and the percentage of wealth received by the top percent has since climbed to levels not seen in this country since the First World War. And here's a graph that shows that uh, decline and then rise of uh, the percentage uh, of wealth received by the richest 1%. Now, I'm sure <clears throat> some of you may see the uh, immediate implications of this graph, that the Thatcherites were a bunch of venal uh, uh, tyrants who tore our country apart and it all went wrong in 1979. And that may well be true, but only up until 1997, when the Tories were thrown out of power. And as you'll notice, the graph doesn't change in 1997. It keeps on climbing. There is no turnaround when New Labour come to power. Why did this happen? Well, during the post-war period, while workers extended their rights, the economic liberalism that predominated before universal suffrage underwent a transformation. Advances in technology, especially air travel, had made possible a globalised market in goods and skills. Despite the fact that the global economy was still based on a national model that allowed governments to efficiently levy taxes and labour to successfully organise. Now, in response to this tension between markets and nation states, an economic neoliberalism emerged that recognised no legitimacy other than that of the free market. Margaret Thatcher introduced this doctrine into our society in the 1980s, and as you can see from this graph, Tony Blair remained true to its basic principles. The neoliberal project takes the form of a rejection of any form of public control or accountability. Whatever the, op, uh, whatever the economic problem, 
deregulation and privatisation are pushed as the answer. And if this doesn't deliver prosperity, well, its supporters claim that's because the market is not free enough and push for even greater deregulation. Neoliberalism not only holds up the free market as the best means to run an economy, it also offers capitalism a means by which to escape from any responsibility for outcomes. As such, it's a form of fundamentalism, almost religious in its form, whose adherents pay lip service to an invisible hand, which is said to ensure that good enterprise always succeeds, while bad enterprise always fails. Free market economists also believe in animal spirits whose activity will lift the economy. Now, I don't know about you, but this sounds to me like the stories that our ancestors told one another to explain things that they didn't understand in the, in the days before the RSA enlightened them. And given the complexity of modern financial instruments, such as the notoriously complex collateralized debt obligations, which is even hard to say, never mind uh, work, understand, uh, you know, it's, it's, it could perhaps be forgiven if, the, if they, even they don't understand how the market works, that they should use a kind of mythology of invisible hands and animal spirits and pictures on the cave wall to explain something that they they don't really want to articulate. And, and in the face of um, this kind of uh, attempt to suggest these, these mythical forces are there, you know, it, it is, in some ways, it is like the, the stories that we were told in the dark. It's a, it's a, a classic con trick, the invisible hand, in which those benefiting from the markets can claim that any damage done to national economies or the social fabric as a result of their decisions are in fact nothing to do with them at all but simply a function of the market. And in the face of such blind fundamentalism, anyone seeking to create different outcomes by regulation or by capping excessive remuneration is scolded for being unrealistic. All legitimacy comes from the market. However, this graph suggests otherwise. Clearly, it is possible to create in a free market conditions that close the gap between the richest and the poorest. How is that done? How is it possible to do that? Well, here's another graph that shows the membership of trade unions over the same period. The blue line is the membership of, of trade unions. Do you see any correlation there? The power of the unions to hold capitalism to account mirrors the decline in the ability of the top 1% to hang on to their profits. This suggests that something can be done. Now, I grew up, left school and entered the economy during those years of the peak of uh, union activity and the low point of the, uh, for the one percenters. And uh, I don't really feel that I live under a Soviet system, I'll be perfectly honest with you. There was industrial strife, that's true, and we will probably never get back to our industrial base, but there was a great degree of accountability within our society. At the time, the financial sector was a service industry, more or less geared to help the production of goods and to ensure safe conditions for saving and credit. Of course, this was destroyed by the Big Bang, Margaret Thatcher's sudden deregulation of the London Stock Exchange in October 1986. Overnight, the firewalls that had protected retail banking were removed and a casino mentality took hold. With it came the market fundamentalism of neoliberalism. The long-term planning needed for industrial innovation was replaced by the short-term gains of gambling on the stock market. Profits were shifted away from paying employees towards shareholder dividends. And when wages began to lag behind, cheap credit was pumped into the economy to ensure that no one felt left out of the boom. Now, of course, those who live on credit can't afford to save. And as fewer and fewer had pensions of any value, ownership of property became the only practical way to build a nest egg for the future. 
And now, after 35 years of deregulation, privatisation and union bustings, wages are flatlined, banks are unwilling to lend, and our young people face a real possibility of being the first generation since the war to grow up poorer than their parents. Where did it all go wrong? The graph, this graph, suggests that a citizen's ability to hold capital account, to account in the workplace, in the markets, in civil society, is key to making the economy work for everyone, not just those at the top. And it will take, to do that, it will take nothing less than the creation of a new political settlement on a par with those of 1948 and 1689. This will involve, obviously, strengthening both workers' representation at a corporate level and, probably, the nationalisation of some utilities and other crucial infrastructure. But if it's just about the economy, it doesn't go far enough. In order to engage everyone, important changes really need to occur outside of the workplace, within society. The task before us is not merely to create a sustainable economy that doesn't lurch from bust to boom, but to address the glaring imbalance that has arisen between London and the rest of the country. Now, devolution has already given the Scots the wherewithal to challenge the neoliberal orthodoxy that Westminster promotes. And with similar powers devolved to Wales and Northern Ireland, they too could start to create a different social economy. England, however, has yet to enjoy the benefits of devolution. And part of the reason for that is that we do not have a border between ourselves and the Westminster Parliament. And as a result of that, the kind of civic nationalism that's taken root in Wales and in Scotland hasn't been able to find any purchase. There are people who campaign for an English Parliament, for a, an English version of devolution, but they have yet to explain how such a Parliament would not be captured by the City of London, as the Westminster Parliament has been. In order to shift the balance of power away from the southeast of England, we need something other than devolution in England. We need decentralisation, offering the same powers that the Scottish Parliament has to the regions of England. Now, I'm going to take a quick wet here before I pull a rabbit out of the hat and show you exactly how we're going to do that, he says, hopefully. Although I was, while I was um, doing a little bit of reading before this, I did notice that uh, your, uh, your governor, Matthew Taylor, wrote a blog this week where he, he confessed that he, was, he had a terrible habit of coming up with unfeasible suggestions. And I may be about to commit that sin. I did feel, I did warm to him. When I read that, I thought, ah, he's a dreamer like me. Here's to him. He paid for this water, I'm going to give him a bit of credit. So, yeah. Where do we begin to try to shift the power away from, <clears throat> away from uh, corporations and the financial powerhouse? Uh, of London, how and where to be begin. Well, I, I believe that we must begin that by making the most unaccountable people accountable. And the most unaccountable people in the British Constitution are in the very heart of Westminster, in the Houses of Parliament, where for 800 years unaccountable men and women have sat in judgment on our laws and customs. The House of Lords is, I believe, the place to start the long process of rebalancing the accountability question in, in the UK. Now, before you all say, oh, you know, laws reform's not an issue with the electorate, take a look at the manifesto of, of the three main political parties from the last election. Labour, Liberal Democrats, even the Tories, felt the need to include a clear commitment to introduce an elected second chamber, if elected. 
Because the, the truth about the Lords is that there are very few people who are satisfied with the status quo apart from their Lordships themselves. Members of Parliament voted in favour of an elected second chamber as recently as 2007 and in, in polling last year the public were 69% in favour of election. And it's not as if we can afford to do nothing. In an attempt to do it yourself reform, recent Prime Ministers have sought to attain a broad political balance within, within the upper house following each general election by appointing enough peers to try and reflect the, the strength of the House of Commons. The problem with that is peers can't be removed, which means that instead of you know, starting from scratch, the only way to do that is to beef up the numbers if you're really going to create a genuine balance. So, if, as expected, at the next election the Liberal Democrat vote collapses, the need to balance the House, the Second Chamber, the Lords, around a base number of already sitting Liberal Democrat peers could potentially send membership of the House of Lords over the 1,000 mark. It's already up around 800. Now, much is made about how appointment to the House of Lords creates a broader pool of talent than that in the Commons, but in terms of representation, it's simply not the case. 45% of peers are from London and the South East. 64% are from south of the Seven Humber Line. 95% are white. 78% are male. 82% are over 60. And despite the good work that members of the Upper House do, the opaque nature of appointment continues to undermine the legitimacy of Parliament. And that's going to be the elephant in the room at the next election. Although, obviously, the debate is going to be dominated by the economy, politicians will be wondering if the disconnect between voters and the electorate will again lead to no single party being given a mandate to govern. Now, obviously, scandals in Westminster have played a part in that process, that strange result that wasn't really a result that we got at the last election. But away from the headlines, politics is in danger of becoming a spectator sport for many citizens. Because 59% of parliamentary constituencies are now regarded as safe seats. And in those seats, when the election is called, voters know already who's going to win. In a long-term one-party constituency, which I was born in one, in Barking, in East London, Labour have been in power there since 1935. I now live in one, in West Dorset. The Conservatives have been in power there since 1835. Might as well be. <clears throat> and in a long-term one-party constituency, the incentive to join a political party that's not the one that wins is very, very low. I mean, trying to convince your neighbours to go down the polling station once again to back a losing horse it's a form of social suicide, really, isn't it, to be honest? You know. And even when people do make the effort, the majority could be wondering if it was worth voting at all. At the last election, an unprecedented 52.8% of votes were cast for losing candidates. And representative democracy, at its heart, has to be about people voting. But if the electorate come to believe that their votes don't really achieve anything, that we may find that our democracy is in decline. I believe that reform of the House of Lords, if done correctly, could address this issue by giving greater meaning to every vote in the general cast in the general election. And this issue has been on the agenda since Labour's partial reform in 1999, when all but 92 hereditary peers were removed from the legislature. But since then, the stumbling block for reformists has been the need to maintain the primacy of the House of Commons. The two-chamber, or bicameral system of parliament that exists in Britain, works on the principle that one house has more legitimacy than the other. Whilst both houses can legis uh, initiate legislation, our second chamber, the House of Lords, must eventually accept the will of the primary chamber the House of Commons. And this process relies on the fact that MPs are directly elected by their constituents, giving them greater legitimacy than the appointed members of the House of Lords. No one who hopes to bring democracy to the upper chamber can ignore the need to preserve the primacy of the Commons, not least because it's members of the Commons themselves who will ultimately um, make the decision on whether or not to 
implement reform. The challenge then for reform is to come up with a form of election that expresses the will of the people in the House of Lords, but does not confer the same mandate, the same legitimacy, the same power as that enjoyed by MPs. Now, my response to that conundrum is to suggest a form of indirect election for the second chamber. Now, indirect election is a common method of maintaining the balance of power in a bicameral system. Both France and Germany use indirect election to uh, maintain the primacy of their lower house. In France, they do this by uh, the upper house is um, put together by an electoral college of local elected representatives. So it has input from the voters one step removed. And in Germany, the state uh, governments, parties in the state governments appoint members to the, to the upper house. Now the method that I am uh, suggesting, the method of indirect election that I'm proposing is a new idea that has not yet been put to use. The secondary mandate system is a form of indirect election that distributes seats in the second chamber in proportion to the votes cast in the general election. Now, under the current electoral system, I'm sure you'll be aware, if you vote for a losing candidate, your vote goes in the bin, and that's done with. At the last election, for the first time, 52.8% of votes went into the bin. The secondary mandate system utilises all of the votes cast to produce an upper chamber that reflects the will of the people. This method will result in representation at Westminster for 90% of votes cast. How does it work? This is the science. Prior to the election, each party would compile a list of candidates for each of the 12 regions and nations of the UK. Once the polls are closed, all of the votes cast in each region will be tallied and the candidates elected according to the percentage of votes cast for their party, reading from the top of the list. Each region would return a maximum of 25 successful candidates, creating a house of around 300. Now, the aim of the secondary mandate is to protect the primacy of the Commons, while at the same time giving greater legitimacy to the second chamber. However, it does have other advantages, the most notable of which is that it encourages participation in the general election by adding value to everyone's vote. I don't believe that people will get off their asses and go out and vote for people who are only going to scrutinise legislation. I believe an elected chamber will have a turnout similar to the European elections, to council elections, heaven forbid, to the elections for uh, police commissioners. So it encourages people to go out and cast their vote in the general election in the knowledge that there's a very, very strong 90% to 95% chance that they will get representation for their party at Westminster. Another advantage is that it gives a voice to the regions at a time when London and the South East dominate both the, natural, the national debate and the economy. If each of the regions sends 25 members to Westminster, it should be possible by finding things that we have in common in the southwest with people in the northwest and the northeast and elsewhere around the country to start that process of rebalancing, of, of decentralisation that I believe is crucial to greater accountability. Over the past 30 years, civil society has been battered and bruised by a sharp elbowed neoliberalism that has cut corners in the pursuit of profits and swept away time-worn custom in the name of progress. It has sought to give the impression of inevitability that the free market alone is capable of delivering the best outcome for everyone. Central to this revolution has been the market's resistance to any form of accountability. Yet the events of the past five years have put into question the functioning of markets, their purpose and the outcomes that they have delivered. In order to increase profits, neoliberalism, ne neoliberalism has needed to undermine security among the workforce, leaving people feeling they have no control over their lives anymore. This sense of powerlessness has in turn given rise to a cynicism that looks for scapegoats among the poorest and most vulnerable 
in our society. Wherever we look, in Fleet Street, in Grangemouth, in the tax dodging corporations that line our high streets, we face the absolute power of a market that believes it is above the law. I believe that we need to push back against that power, just as our ancestors did against kings and popes, until we reach a new settlement with capitalism. And I believe that the first step towards that goal can be taken by reforming the Lords in a manner that reboots our democracy and kickstarts a revolution in society, not least because it can be done at the next election or the one after that. It can be plumbed in. Now, for too long, we have allowed the corporations to game the system in this country and elsewhere. I believe the time has come to renew our traditional commitment to accountability by taking on the absolute power of the markets, by redefining socialism as a means by which we hold capitalism to account. Our slogan is already out there. It's in the plazas of Spain. It's in the mouths of Los Indignados. Their cry is, democracia real ya, real democracy now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Billy. No worries. Um, can you just I'm ask a couple of questions? Can you tell me, first of all, the genesis of this idea? Because I first read, you wrote a pamphlet about this I quite did, a long yeah. time ago. Yeah, that was uh, how long ago it was. It was before you could blog. I wrote a bloody pamphlet. Well, you know, I thought, you know, Orwell wrote pamphlets, Payne wrote pamphlets, the, the levelers wrote pamphlets. So I'll write a pamphlet. Why shouldn't I not do that? Where did the idea of the secondary well, mandate and concentrating on the House of Lords I've, come I've from? I've always had a bug about the House of Lords. I, I had a big, big falling out during the years of Red Wedge with the House Martins. Kept banging on about the monarchy. And I'm like, yes, the monarchy's just nothing. It's the cherry on the cake, you know. The real power in this country is in the House of Lords. That's, that's where we should, you know, we should get those Norman bastards out. That's where we should be focusing. I've refined my argument a little since then. But, but so I just mentioned that. You know, when I was involved in Charter 88, it was all very interesting, but I, you know, I said to him, look, there's, you know, there's two things I'll always do, and that is, you know, anything to do with House of Lords reform and anything involving Susanna York. And as a consequence, I did <laughs> some Susanna York House of Lords things with them. <laughs> and and the, the chair of Charter 88, when the Wakeham Commission was uh, set up in the late 90s, rang me up and said, you should come along to this and listen to this, these deliberations, because they're really interesting. So I was living at London at the time, so I went along, and um, it was very, very interesting, but the, I, I, I happened to be there when Lord Mackay gave the Conservatives view of uh, reform, and, and Tony Wright, Dr Tony Wright, who was an MP then, he's not any longer, I don't think, but a great constitutional mind, and they just turned themselves inside out, trying to overcome the the issue of commons primacy. They were trying to bend space-time around it. It just seemed ridiculous to me. So I thought, I just thought, why don't you just use the votes in a general election? Wouldn't that sort of... So I said this to Pam, and she said, oh, you know, we were having a cup of tea afterwards. She said, oh, that's a good idea. Why don't you, why don't you put that in there? I said, well, why don't you? I'm a bit busy. She said, well, we've already done our... So I didn't actually, actually literally have a fag packet because I didn't smoke, but it was literally one of those ideas on the back of a fag packet. So I thought to myself, well, if I can write it down on one page of A4, I'll send it in and see what happens. Actually, it only took half a page and I had to invent some other stupid thing about linking up Lords by visual pre-internet stuff to do it. Anyway, I sent it in. They, they invited me in to give some evidence and I sort of engaged in it since then. You know, I think it's not enough just to sing about politics. You have to sort of, you have to engage. You know, there's a lot of cynicism in the world. Both, you know, fired at us and just out there among the, the, on the internet. To me, the only real antidote to that is activism. And you have to find ways and means to engage. And I'm not waiting for someone to come and ask me about this stuff. I, I, you know, I'd rather be putting out, throwing out ideas, throwing out sparks. It's probably, is it fair to say that, I mean, this idea has acquired new aspects, really, in the wake of the crash, that you weren't necessarily thinking quite as vividly about 
the unaccountable power of capital no. and so on when you first came up with the idea. No, no, no. And yet it seems, yeah. if you think about this, because the power of capital is synonymous mm. with London mm. and because London and big business are now synonymous with the political class and so on, it acquires all these other elements. Yeah. Well, I mean, it was, it was implied during the Blair years. They were talking about this, you know. I did go along and, and you know, to events like this and we all took Charter 88, uh, ran quite a few of them. And we talked about these issues and I debated these issues with other people who believed in direct election, who, you know, weren't so concerned about the primacy. But, you know, my, my sense from talking to MPs was that they would, you know, it was like uh, they just wouldn't go anywhere that, that put their... Ma why, why should they? You know, they have a very special place in our democracy. Why should they, um, you know, create a, a, a house that w would be a, a, a challenge to their power? I mean, particularly a directly elected proportional house, you could argue, is more legitimate than the House of Commons. It's, it's ridiculous. It wouldn't work like that. And I never felt comfortable with those people who would just abolish the, the House of Lords, you know. The House of Lords has a very, very important job, which is to help members of Parliament to hold the executive to account. Take the Lords away, you're more or less giving the Prime Minister Parliament, really. Um, you know, because the second chamber under the secondary mandate would be proportional, there's all, it's almost unimaginable that the government today would have a majority in both houses. No government has won more than 50% since. The Second World War. So certainly not now. No, I mean we're in the era of even the the winning party now, perhaps getting 35, 36. So of the vote. you know the Lords, the role. That, I think the Lords plays a very, very important role, but at the same time, I think it's it, the manner of appointment undermines our democracy and brings our democracy into question. I think, you know, the way that that Blair and Brown and to some some degree Cameron as well, but particularly Labour used that the House of Lords to sort out all the problems. You know, not letting backbenchers really get involved in, in making amendments. I mean, I spoke to backbenchers who had really good amendments that they put forward that were knocked back by their own party and then given as concessions to unelected lords, Tory lords often as well. I mean, you know, if you're someone who's, who's trying to stand up for your constituents, that yeah. kind of treatment is just unspeakable. Uh, one thing that, that occurs when you're outlining it mm. is to do with party lists, yep. right? Yeah. And how, within this system, you would avoid party lists being just stuffed mm. full of party hacks. I mean, mm. I, you know, it's not that long since party conference season. Nope. You see these slightly terrifying clumps of yep. people who could be 22 and they might be 42. Yep. I can never tell yeah, looking yeah, yeah. at them. <laughs> uh, and I wouldn't want them in the House of Commons. And probably, actually, neither would the party managers who run their party. So what would be to stop sort of second-rate awful career politicians being well, on these party lists? Well, to, to stop career politicians going in, you, uh, and this is from the Wakeham Commission now, this is not my idea, you would uh, you know, you'd be elected for a three-parliament term, single, non-renewable, three-parliament, 15-year term, and not be able to be eligible for the House of Commons for 10 years after the end of your term. So that would hopefully mean that that's not a part of the greasy pole, on one hand. Um, but the closed list argument is a, is a cause of, of concern for... Uh, anybody who believes in, in uh, participatory democracy. There's absolutely no reason for the parties to use closed lists in the European elections. There's no reason why we, as an electorate, should not be able to put those people on, on that list in order ourselves. However, and, and if, if I was setting up a new um, parliament or a new uh, assembly, you know, open participatory lists would be top of the, you know, top of the, top of the heap. However, the House of Lords is not a blank sheet of paper. It's an already exist, part of an already existing legislature, and it has a particular job to do as a counterweight. And I argue that when you put a mark on a piece of paper as a voter, you are giving somebody a direct mandate, a personal mandate, which carries with it Great authority, great responsibility. But in, our, in the House of Lords, we want something different. We want a different flavour. We need the legitimacy to just be one step removed, to rather than be a direct manifestation of the will of the people. It needs to be an abstract manifestation of the will of the people. So therefore, in this instance, and this instance alone, closed lists are absolutely crucial to the proper functioning of a bicameral system. OK, well, how do we stop them being full of stuff? Well, suits? you can't legislate our parties elect um, candidates. You can't legislate for that. So what you would hope is that parties would hold regional primaries 
in which party members and perhaps other people voted on a one-member, one-vote basis to uh, put the list in order. You would also hope that in the uh, interest of a balanced second chamber that they would zip the lists, which means they would have two primaries, one male, one female, and at the end of that they would integrate them together to okay. make a male, female, male, female. Obviously, you know, in 12 regions and nations, you'd have to have six of them that were going to start male, six of them that were going to start female. But there is a possibility for parties to do that. Those of you who like wonk-type phrases, it's called zipped regional omov. A frisson, a frisson of wonkery That's ran like through a, the room. song titled by the fall. <laughs> it does, <actually>. um, <laughs> uh, Last question from me. Taken as read that there would be an improvement in the extent to which the, the upper house was socially representative. Yeah. It would no longer be 64% southeast mm -hmm. and 78% mm -hmm. male and all the rest of it. Mm -hmm. In terms of their approach to politics, if this worked, right? Yeah. What would, what would be the approach of these legislators, ideally? What sort of people would you like to sit in this reconstituted upper house? That's not our job, John. Our job is to set up the circumstances whereby more people can have a say. It's not our job to say who those people are, what they say, or what they're going to come in there. The secondary mandate is merely a, a key to unlock the possibility of a, a, a more decentralised state. You want those people to represent something other than the status quo well, in London. You, let, let me ask you a, a, a related but slightly different question, which is then what it would do to the, to the elected government. Say we're in a situation now where we have a, a coalition government, which as far as people like me are concerned, I think this is actually a, a matter of provable fact, they are doing things that they, they were not elected mm. to do, right? Yeah. There is a large degree of unaccountable power yeah. here. The NHS reorganisation, what they're doing at the welfare state, the level of cuts, all of that. They were actively deceitful about some of that. What would this reconstituted house do to the kind of government that we've got now? Well, it, I, I would like to think that... <clears throat> It's, its role, its current role, and I, I, you know, I have nothing against the households. I think they do a lot of good job. You know, God, this is not a Guy Fawkes option. You know, it's, it's not, you know, I think they do a lot of very good work. But I would like to think that, given specifically given a regional role, they would start to take on the power of the, uh, the financial centre of London and start to give uh, real uh, teeth to the, the thing that we all know, which is that the economy in London, the, the centralisation in London, the, the um, way that London directs the debate is having a negative effect. You see those figures today in The Guardian. It's crazy. In, in, you know, uh, not just on house prices, but on how people connect with society. And it needs rebalancing. And, and I, again, I can't, can only stress this is just the first step. I'm not saying this is to solve these problems, but a recognition of uh, uh, a, a different regional perspective on any issue that they understand that rather than it, as they are constituted today, the House of Lords as a group of people whose opinions are welcomed and recognised and appreciated, that their regional representation not only um, uh, brings that to the, to the Commons but puts down roots in the region that begin that process by which we can uh, you know, start to think about giving the regions more control in the way that Scotland has been given more control. So you know, the path to a, to a, a decentralised state it needs to be organic, it needs to be thought of but it needs to be bottom up not top down because when it's been tried to do that before you know, the offer that the Labour Party made, the Labour government rather, made to the North East, you know, I wouldn't, you know, it, it was, you know, it was nothing. It's just like a, a, a glorified quango, you know. You know, we need, we need something that makes the people in the North East feel that they are part of our society, part of our community, not something that, you know, stuff happens to a long, long way away. And so. I'm really interested in, in that um, approach to the English question, you know, that we've got to look at whether or not, I think, whether or not the Scots decide to be independent. The, the issue of, of devolution of power is going to be 
on the driving forces in well, our I mean, the, 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 the very fact that Scottish independence is a live issue yeah. is precisely because, I would argue, London is such an overweening yeah. influence on politics. Yeah. Because they, it's yeah. not an English question, it's a London no, question. it is, yeah. It is, yeah. They have more in common with areas of, of, more in common with areas of England than London does. Many of them, yeah. OK. Uh, we're going to run to about ten past seven, so I'm going to take questions and points uh, in groups of three, not so we ignore you, so we get through as many as we possibly can. So that's what we'll do, and then we'll come back to Billy. So... Starting with one well, I didn't there, know there was a clock over there. I should have kept my eye on action. I'm sorry. Cardigan on there, followed by gentleman in the middle, and then we'll take one more. So far away. Hi. So I need a pen. Um, one of the primary roles I see in the House of Lords is the fact it's full of experts in their field, and I, I take the, the party appointments is kind of irrelevant in that because it's they're usually misused. But what do you see, do you see a role still for crossbench peers that aren't affiliated with political parties? Because I think they're a really valuable part of Parliament, and I wanted to know what you thought. That's a very good question. Gentleman there. It's exactly the same question. I think that the, <laughs> the issue here is that the um, House of Lords has expertise that you don't have in the, in the Commons. And in fact, the Lords performs a very important function of making legislation better through revision. If you insisted on only professional politicians being there, you might increase their legitimacy, but you wouldn't increase the expertise. For instance, the House of Commons had very few scientists in it. You have far more scientists in the House of Lords. So I wondered how you would deal with that particular place. I should point out that I work for a member of the House of Lords who, who uh, is based at London School of Economics. Okay, and one more, we have one more question. Yep. Gentleman in the front row here. Yeah, Peter, Peter Cook. Uh, used to be a punk, um, turned into an academic, found that academics could actually uh, do punk rock, but they uh, had worse alliteration and rhyming. <laughs> Same stuff. Yeah. Um, <laughs> academics, a uh, good book called um, The Death of Deference, if that's a social trend where people now speak truth to power. That comes out in everyday life when people shout at people on question time yeah. rather than sit there and go, yeah, very good. So is the internet a facilitating mechanism to breaking down that ability to speak truth to power is my sort of question. Okay. Okay. Let, me, let me quickly try and... Um, we'll answer that one first. Very quickly, yeah. Um, I think the internet is a good uh, facilitator for raising questions. But uh, I also think that it is a, uh, a medium that is riven with cynicism. And, you know, I, I worry that a young Billy Bragg today, if he or she was trying to make their first political ideas on Twitter or on, on a blog, they would attract so much grief, I mean, particularly if they were female, uh, that they might think to themselves, you know what, maybe I'll go and queue up for the X Factor instead. <laughs> so I worry, I do genuinely worry. Some of, the, some of the stuff I get, I mean, it bounces off my... You know, funny, I went, when I was at the Wakeham Commission, um, uh, they were in the sort of tea room before, uh, I won't say who it was, but it was one of Thatcher's old ministers came over and said to me, I suppose he probably said it to everybody up there, he said, uh, Mr Bragg, you know, if, we, if, we, uh, if we're critical of your views today, please don't take it personally. And I said, look, I've been ripped to shreds in the New Musical Express, mate. There's nothing you can say to me, <laughs> all right? That's going to be anything from the way they reviewed my fifth album, so don't worry about it. <laughs> All right. Um, and on the, uh, it wasn't me who did that review. I know oh, it wasn't. Uh, Cross that question, the scientist expert Robert Winston sort of question. Yeah. Um, so with the, with, I mean, Robert Winston's a Labour piss, but yeah. with, with the cross bench peers particularly, and then uh, the associated question of expertise. Well, here's the thing about cross bench peers: if the if the House of Commons was really legitimate, they would be crucial their votes would be absolutely crucial. They would hold the balance of power. But they don't really, do they? Do they? Really? So, I mean, the point about the crossbenches are, and forgive me because I think they do great work, but in democratic terms, they are an anomaly. In, a, in, a, in an, any kind of elected chamber, even if, even if you took a straw poll, even if everybody in this room, we were all suddenly, the House of Lords was removed, and we, all of us in this room, were removed, in order to get stuff done, we would have to form into blocks. We would have to form into parties. You can't actually do business by all being individual experts and come together to deliberate. In terms of politics, to get things voted, every parliament that's been put together, the Irish 
Senate is uh, great and good. And they, they formed themselves into What about expert? Would you lose? Do you, is, how would you address that question of well, losing? here's the thing. I mean, you know, if, if you're going through legislation line yeah. by line and you're yeah. an expert in your field, yeah. clearly it might be a better world well, in which you do that than, than, than the agree. second rate crime I agree. Chaps, well, I think know? I agree. I totally agree in that. And obviously the current, current crossbenchers, you know, if this was happening tomorrow, I would want them to be retained, their membership to be retained, not their voting rights, but their membership and their contribution to be retained, and other experts to follow them. Uh, so that in some form of committee, that the elected members of the Lords could, when those issues come up, they could take that on board. Because the, the thing is about a second chamber is that um, the House of Commons has so much downtime because they have to do constituency work, that the, the Lords would have a lot more time to deliberate and to discuss and to draw in, invite people to come in and, and speak. You know, they, could, they may even have some other functions. You know, they may be able, be able to do things like, you know, look at secondary legislation or scrutinise all of the um, laws that are coming in from the European Union that, in my opinion, don't get enough scrutiny. So they would have other functions. And I think that, as I said, this is not a Guy Fawkes option. I think that there would be a role for people like the crossbenchers, but in terms of the elected uh, element of the actual chamber, I'm afraid, I, and I feel bad about this because it makes it sound like I don't, you know, I mean, Doreen Lawrence has just been put into the second chamber. This doesn't mean I don't have respect for, for people like her and other crossbenchers and their contribution. I want to retain that contribution, but I happen to believe that if we are going to reconnect the electorate with participatory democracy, we have to make these changes. But you would get more, you'd get more maverick non-political class voices in the sense that there'd be a sizable one would assume there'd be a sizable green representation. UKIP would. would be in there, there would. on their current yep, showing. There would. The nationalist parties would do pretty well. There would. I mean, basically, and you'd, you know, you'd need more about four percent to get a seat. Right. You know, that might let the you know, a party like the British National Party in, but my experience with them in Barkin and Dagenham when they were elected was that they were firstly elected in anger because Labour had done nothing, or it was felt that La New Labour had done nothing for people in Barkin and Dagenham in, in the, in the mid-2000s. Uh, Tony Blair famously said, we don't have to worry about the white working class, they have no one else to vote for. And to their credit, the people in Barkin and Dagenham, having voted them in, saw them for what they were, and voted them straight back out again. So I trust the electorate, concerning though it is, I trust the electorate. UKIP, I, you know, I know some people are worried about them, but you know, not liking the European Union is a, is a, is a reasonable, to me, is a, is a reasonable position really, you know. So I don't, you know, I don't think that the, the crossbenchers should be turned out into the cold, but we, we need to, you know, we need to, bring a greater legitimacy and we have to start somewhere and that is the, to me, is the most immediate place that we can actually have some effect that actually has a real change on people's lives and addresses the disconnect between Westminster and the electorate. Okay. It's not the fault of the, the crossbenchers but unfortunately, they, you know, that anomaly needs to be sorted out. Okay. Three more questions, points, whatever. Woman there, please. And then... Uh, Gentlemen, further along. Hold on a minute. Could, could I take you back right to the beginning and the title? One of the things she was talking about was the press. Yeah. And I just wonder what's the answer. If you were saying you're concerned that people with money are the people who are running the press, mm. um, maybe we could take The Guardian as an example. Would you actually have a job if there wasn't somebody... The Guardian's losing money. Mm. Somebody's backing that. So we're run by a trust, in fact. It's run by a trust. We're not run by any... No, but it's putting money in. It's losing mm. money. And all the newspapers are losing money. So if we don't have philanthropists, does, are we going to see the end of the, the press as we know it? Which I think is Whoa. very, very worrying. Oh, can we, can we just, just for the sake of time, can we... Uh, yeah, sure. Gentleman there in the V-neck jumper, and then the gentleman further along in the grey suit at the end of the row. Can you... Wait... wait. We're doing all right for time, but keep them brief. We are, keep them brief, yeah. Okay, th uh, thanks. I think this is a really interesting idea, and it would be great to have a proportional House of Lords, uh, you know, not as good as a proportional House of Commons. But what I don't understand is how that will achieve your aim of um, uh, increasing uh, uh, equity between the rich and the, the rest, and increasing the, the equity between the regions and London, uh, unless you change the relationship uh, between the House of Commons and Lords. The House of Lords doesn't have any power. 
Uh, it has power to be you know, awkward, but it, it can't do anything. It can't give the regions more money. It can't do anything about the city. So can you explain how that would work? OK, and then gentlemen at the end. Well, of course, the House of Lords does have degrees of power, uh, not complete power, but you haven't said enough, Billy, really, to indicate why we should have a second chamber anyway. Um, do you suggest that in other countries where there isn't a second chamber, they've all failed, uh, the people don't have power? Uh, have you examined the possibility of one chamber, but building into the overall government mechanism, advisory systems of one kind or another, bodies that you the valuable people you've talked about having a role, but not in the, same, in the form of a second chamber. OK. Thank you. Let's do those in reverse order, then. OK. So, first of all, why have a second chamber at all? Uh, I think that um, in our system, a second chamber uh, is, a, I believe, is a counterweight to the power of the executive. That's where the real problem is, the concentration of power in the executive. If you win the election, you get all of the leader, uh, levers of power for five years and you don't have to consult with anybody. That, is a, to me, is a, a problem, and I think the House of Lords has a role to play in uh, helping backbenchers to hold the executive to account. That's the role. And um, this isn't really about the House of Lords. This is about connecting with the people. The House of Lords is merely the vehicle through which this is done, which, in answer to, to refer to your question, I'm, I'm talking about this is a, a seed route to that process. The first thing we've got to do is make people believe that their participation means something. That we, we kind of renew civic society in a way that makes people think, well, you know, we can stop that oil refinery from changing. We have the power to do that. We're in control about what happens in this part of the world. And through that, by, as I sort of touched on at the end, a, a, you know, it involves a rethinking of, of what the definition of socialism is, which probably isn't a bad thing to do after what happened in 1989 as not necessarily the abolition of capitalism, which I think, you know, maybe communism and socialism parted their way on that at some point, but actually the means by which we hold capitalism to account. Um, and this doesn't guarantee socialism. This doesn't mean socialism will come. It doesn't mean an equal society will come like that with the new House of Lords. But it does begin that process of making people believe that they have a say in society again and that... Um, neoliberal capitalism can be held to account that we can we do have some say so it's that's a long term that's a longer you know this isn't a brandist argument in which we have a revolution and everyone so you know for those we, you know, who didn't see news night last night yeah where, where there's a revolution it all just happens i mean this is a you know this is still the parliamentary road to socialism but this one goes through the house of lords and then that uh, the first question <clears throat> yes i'm paraphrasing so forgive me if i'm if i if, uh, and, and without wealthy individuals who, for various motives, put money in, what do you do? And um, I know my answer is buy The Guardian every day. If you, wa if, you wanna, if you wanna read news put together without the influence of a big, titanic, horrible yeah, millionaire, then spend a quid 20 or whatever it is now, 140 possibly. I get mine for nothing. Yeah, well, we may be... We may be put it in your... Polly Toynbee's argument is put The Guardian in your will. There's another one. We may be the last generation that reads <laughs> big pieces of paper with words on every day. Like we are the last generation that buys pieces of plastic with music on them. That may be changing. That's not, I don't think that's anything we should be afraid of because it opens our ability to get information across the internet. And to, and to you know, the Guardian, I mean, the, the role of the Guardian or any newspaper, I think, is a filter of information. And we trust that particular filter. We, you know, the Guardian is our, is our those of us who are any newspaper, is our um, uh, window onto the world. And we, we read that newspaper because it both reflects our, our views but also allows us to see things that, that maybe, you know, we're, we're interested in, we believe in. So the, the internet is still in its phase of having no filters where everything is available all the time to everybody. But I do believe that that process will change and it will begin to focus on people in the way that the newspapers changed and began to stop being just about you know, uh, gossip and began about to editorialise. You know, originally newspapers didn't really do a great deal of that. You know, they were talking about news and what was happening and, and that, that process. So it's a scary process. There is no, there is no alternative in, in the scenario that you talk about to Rupert Murdoch. So the question then is how do we hold them to account? And that's where Leveson comes in. OK, uh, we, we'll do another round because we've got about five minutes still. I'll be quick. So... Some more questions for women would be a very, very good idea. Are there any? 
when with their hands up at all? Yes, no. It's been quite male dominated so far. It has. However, that. Go on, you can have a question, sir. Yeah, in the on. expectation we might get some from women um, after I'm you. Just, uh, uh, obviously, we've had a vote on proportional representation uh, where we can get better democracy, um, I would argue, and obviously the people didn't want it. Um, I wonder what your, your views on that were. And then if you argue that maybe it was because of the m media backing against you know, proportional representation, it then becomes a bit of a circular argument in terms of how you actually implement your plan. Okay. Well, you don't, yeah, by, by, um, by making a manifesto commitment to it and bringing it in through the Salisbury Convention. The, the Salisbury Convention means the House of Lords must pass any bill that is in a manifesto for a party that's been given a mandate. So, you, you know. Okay. No, no, not legally binding. No, there, there's a convention in the, in, the House of, in the House of Lords. But uh, if it's in a manifesto, the Lords has to pass it, right? That's the convention. That's the Salisbury Convention, yeah. Okay. And, you know, there's other ways of doing it. You know, um, Lloyd George famously threatened to create a thousand peers to pass his finance bill in 1911 that broke the, the feudal power of the Lords. Okay. There's other ways of doing it. But, you know, referenda are for people who can't make up their minds, governments who can't make up their minds. You know, either we want a proportional system or we don't. And, and I would prefer that you know, we could have an election where that's an issue and we vote in a party that does that and they do it rather than, you know, throwing it out in the long grass and the hope that it might not happen. I'm fed up with that. Can we, hold on a minute. Yeah, it does need to be in a manifesto. Yeah, that would be my ideal way. It would be in a manifesto okay. at the next election, uh, brought in at in, in, uh, the election afterwards and then we'll, you know, we'll be on our way. Okay, two more. Ah, good, right. Woman there. Well... Thank you. I'm and we'll take what we, before we go back to Belize, just one more. Uh, that will take that gentleman there in the yeah, blue shirt, and that's it. Okay. So I'm interested to know, at the moment, there's such a massive disconnection between the electorate and the politicians and the seats of power, how you'd actually go about convincing people to vote. People don't vote mm. in massive numbers, they don't vote. Mm. And those that do feel that their vote isn't worth anything because it's not. Mm. Um, there was a great website that was doing the rounds at the last election that uh, calculated what your vote was worth. It put in where you lived you know, and, and, and told you what it was worth. And yep. in most cases, it, your vote is not worth a single vote. And yeah. how would you go about making those changes? Okay, and then the man there. Um, yeah, the, the question really relates to the, the accountability that comes uh, from the financial uh, backing of, uh, the, of the current political parties. Um, you talked about the working class holding capitalism to account. Uh, the question for, for me is which party represents the working class nowadays? And with the financial backing of the parties mm -hmm. as it is, um, party lists may well still contain people who will do what the... The, the fund managers of the parties tell them. Okay. Yeah, well, I mean, I think, you know, in, uh, everyone, everyone knows that the, uh, the, the um, you know, council tax housing bans don't relate in any way to what the real value of houses is now. And I think the whole idea of class doesn't relate anymore. We need a total rethink <clears throat> what we mean when we talk about class. I want to see ordinary, more ordinary working people in the House of Commons rather than people who went to university, did PPE, became an advisor and then got a gig. I think we're all fed up with seeing those kind of people in there. But that means you, me and John getting off our butts and uh, everybody else here. I went to university and, and did PPE, I've had Did it. you? Oh, you're out, sorry. <laughs> you're out. You're out. I mean, that's... that's, I mean, what, that's, what, that's what, your records that's, do to people, I'm that's what in, that's what in my <laughs> case. That's what's inherent in, in the idea of, <laughs> of finding representation outside of London and regional representation is drawing in people with a broader life experience. I mean, you could argue that when we're asking people for a 15-year term and a uh, no, non-renewable term, that you may well find that the people who put themselves forward are people who have had a job and they're now, you know, maybe retiring or towards the end of their, their uh, time. And, and so the House can retain a lot of the values that it has in that, in that term, in the experience of members of the House, you may find that happens. But the conundrum of how to get more working people elected, that's a, that's a failure, that's a tough one for us because it's a failure of the parties themselves rather than of the system per se. And uh, the woman's question yeah. about disconnection and how, mm. even if ostensibly the, the logic of what you're proposing is that votes are worth yeah. more and they count, even then you've got that great wall of disconnection to mm. overcome. How do you do it? 
Well, I, I would get a video of me walking down to the polling station with Russell Brand. <laughs> and him, me and him going in, wearing our West Ham colours. No, I think... Um, <laughs> I think Keep going, that was good. I think really that, um, you know, this is, this is why, this is, my, this is my conundrum that I'm trying to address. The disconnect. You know, I, be I believe in democracy. I believe in participatory democracy. And the, that's why I'm, uh, you know, I believe that the House of Lords needs to be reformed because it doesn't uh, fit into that model. And my first thought is that, you know, if, if I could have, at the last election, known that I could vote Labour and know that I would get representation in the South West, it may have saved me from tactically voting for them yellow bastard Liberal Democrats <laughs> in order to stop a Tory getting in. You know, in my own way, I was trying to right what I perceived to be the flaws in our political system and looked where it left me. I am still suffering the slings and arrows of outrageous tweets <laughs> from people who don't understand tactical voting and think I actually support those toe rags. You know. And who do I vote for next time? Who am I going to go down? You know, in my, it's, it's only Lib Dems and the Tories who get anywhere near. So who am I going to get off my butt and go down and vote Labour or vote Green? What's the, you know? So if I knew that the chances are that that I, you know, I will get representation because this, in theory, this should open up because it is proportional because it has a low entry point, 44, uh, 4 percent to win a seat. It should bring in. It should start to seed the system with smaller parties who would have spokesmen in, and women in the second chamber who would appear on TV to put forward the point of their party and begin. You know, you might find that you have a regional party. You might have a party of the southwest who are interested in farming and fisheries and things like, you know, and it would open up away from the, the sort of calcified two and a bit party system that we're all very, very useful to. So, I, I, you know, it's, it's because of that, uh, you know, persistent problem of people feeling powerless, which I do think is a, a, a key uh, result of, of the way that uh, neoliberal capitalism works, that I'm trying to address that. But I'm trying to do that by giving them the, the incentive to engage again. Because as I said before, the only, only real antidote to this all-pervasive cynicism, I believe, is, is engagement. And that's what, I'm trying to, that's what I'm trying to encourage with this okay. idea. Go, yes, please no, do. Please no, we're do, yeah. almost go out of time, on, so but be please quick. Do. Wait for the mic. Wait for the mic so everyone can hear you. You've got a minute. It was really interesting you mentioned Russell Brand. I grew up with role models like you talking about politics within the sphere of entertainment, and that doesn't happen now. Nobody talks about that. If you're 18 years old, you'll know more about, you know, pimps Have and homes. Have we got homes. another hour here? <laughs> well, yeah, yeah I just... That, you know, I, that is I, another story, you know. I mean, we were just talking about it very, very briefly. We were talking about <laughs> before, before I came here, I said, I'm going to meet Billy Bragg later, and for the first time in my life, I'm not going to ask him why no one makes political music anymore, and you've just done it. <laughs> <laughs> Briefly, my theory. When I was 19 and angry about the world, there was only one medium open to me in which to express that. Nobody invited me to the RSA. Nobody wanted to write a column for the spectator or edit the New Statesman. The only way I could do that was to buy a guitar, write songs, and do go out and do gigs. Now, there's plenty of other, other ways that you can engage. So don't think that just because there aren't a load of Billy Braggs in the charts that the young people aren't interested in politics. They are. It's just that they have other social media now because... Yeah. You know, with the best will in the world, not everybody wants to get up on stage, sing a song and take on an audience. Yeah. So I think that's, in some ways, yeah. it's more open now. More people, you know, can write and can engage. But um, there's still, they're still, you know, something that we have, the communion that we have with our audience that you can't get on the internet. Thank God, else I wouldn't have a job. Very good. No, oh no that's it, I'm afraid. OK. As I say, that could go on for it some could. time. That's another one. Uh, was a, What's um, George Washington doing under God? I was gonna, I'm, I'm going to make my closing jokes about this, so Isn't be careful. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the only thing I was going to say in response to what a gentleman said over there about whether people are interested in constitutional reform or proportional representation, that the last referendum, in my opinion, doesn't prove much more than the people then didn't like Nick Clegg at that point, and I don't, can't say I blame him. Um, That's this a is a flaw in referenda, though, isn't it? People, always. People don't necessarily use it. You know, you hand people a stick... And they don't always use it to prop open the window. Sometimes they use it to whack people with. And unfortunately, that's, 
you know, that's how referendums get used. That's why I, don't put, I personally, I'm not a big fan. I think they're a, they're a cynical ploy. With that image of a big stick, that was a fantastically rich, vivid, and inspiring conversation. Ironically enough, in the glorious irony under the watchful gaze of Robert Lord Romney and Jacob Viscount Folkestone. So thanks to the RSA, but please join me in thanking Billy Brack.